when we cut with the laser, we give it a vector path and the laser just follows that exact vector path. In raster engraving, we define some sort of an image, dark areas to burn, light averages to leave alone. The laser quickly moves left to right, energizing all of the areas to darken and advancing top to bottom as it draws each line. When the laser energizes, the material will absorb its energy and it will start to burn away. Depending on the power of the laser and the properties of the material, the burn area will spread. As the laser moves, it will draw a line. The width of that line will be a function of the burn area as it spreads. So it will vary with the power and it will vary with the material. All this will dictate what kind of a line and what kind of thickness that line will have when we do our engrave. So let's say we're doing a raster engrave and we have our line here and our line is going to have some thickness and of course we're not just going to engrave one line to do an image but we are going to engrave a series of lines and these lines need to be spaced apart. So when we're doing raster engraving and the laser is going back and forth and we are drawing these lines, the distance that we want the laser to draw the lines apart are determined by the width of the lines. And this is called the scan gap. So the scan gap is the distance between each line that's going to draw during a raster engrave pass. And ideally, this distance would be the exact width of the line that it's engraving. So, thicker lines, thicker scan gap, thinner lines, thinner scan gap. And of course, remember, the smaller your scan gap is, that means for a given piece, like three inches by three inches, you're going to need more lines. Therefore, your overall engrave time is going to be greater. So when we do engrave, just like when we cut, we need some recommended settings for speeds and power. And... Uh, on this, we go to our old friend, the wiki, and we have a bunch of recommendations in here. And just like with cutting, uh, these are only recommendations, and you're highly encouraged to use these as a baseline, but then uh, experiment on your own to find optimal settings. So just like with cutting, we can look at a different material. Now, since when we engrave, we don't go all the way through. Thickness doesn't matter for engrave like it does with cut because we're just touching the surface. But if I go down on this list, I go from a cut section in here, and now I have engraves, and I have engraves in all kinds of stuff, including a lot of different stuff that we can't even cut, like glass and meat and granite and uh, what else, some metals that you can actually mark with that. So you can do a little bit more with engraving than you can with cutting. Again, we have speed and power settings. And also, like we said earlier, talking about scan gap, the scan gap is largely a function of the material you are using. So it does list a recommended scan gap for each of these materials that you can engrave. So consult with the wiki, consult with the book in the lab, and at least get recommended speed, power, and scan gap settings for the material you're using. There are two basic methods we have to do engraving uh, with any laser. One is bitmaps, like if we were to have a picture and the picture is consisting of pixels and we wanted uh, the laser to go across and to burn only where the pixels were. Uh, and we're going to be talking about that in a minute. But first, we're going to be talking about something that's actually a little bit easier, and that is uh, vector engraving. And vector engraving is you know, taking either a piece of vector art that you do outside in something like Inkscape or even just doing a drawing directly inside laser cut. For example, the square, if I take a square or a rectangle and I drop that there and I were to engrave this, uh, what the laser would actually do is it would scan back and forth like we talked about the rastering, but it would only turn the laser on for the interior of this polygon. So this is one important concept with vector engraving that you need to be engraving closed polygons. So a square or rectangle like this is an example of a closed polygon. If I were to draw something different, like for example, something like this, this is not a closed polygon. It is a polygon, but it is open, meaning the beginning of the polygon does not attach to the end of the polygon. The problem here is there's no definitive uh, way to differentiate what constitutes being the inside and the outside of the polygon. So the laser would not know how to fill this polygon. If you try to engrave a, a non-closed polygon, it will give you an error and it won't do it. So, for example, rectangle, 
closed polygon really easy. So this is going to be filled with black. Uh, if I were to now take something like, I'll draw an ellipse inside the polygon, uh, I'm going to switch over to Inkscape to better illustrate what would happen here. So I'm in Inkscape right now, which can help us visualize this a little bit better because it can show us what it perceives to be as the filled area. So we have a black outline, which is the exterior of these polygons, and we have red, which represents the filled area. So you can see, again, I have the, uh, the rectangle on the outside, and inside that I have the circle. So it removes the circle from the rectangle. If I were to move the circle outside the rectangle, whoops, I didn't want to do that then again, the circle is just another object. If I were to do something weird, like have one polygon that wasn't fully inside the other, you may get some weird kind of effects like this, where it's kind of turning on and off as it scans across. And uh, the other thing is if I had, let's say, a third polygon that I brought in, I could do that. I could have this outside. Or if that were inside the circle, again, it turns that on there. So this is just basically showing how you can use polygons and control what is the engraved areas and what are the areas that gets left alone. So switching back over to laser cut, another popular thing that you probably want to do is to use the text tool in engraving. And when you lay some text down, like we will, for example this, you really want to use true type because S X H X H X sorry uh, is more of a kind of a stick font used for cutting, but uh, if you use the true type here and you lay fonts down like that, notice that this text here is all consisting of uh, closed polygons, and we could follow the same logic where this would be black, the circle would be white, uh, this T for example would be black. This loop here and the T would be black, and the interior of the T would be white. So the same logic applies as these are closed polygons. So that's what this would happen if I were to engrave that. Uh, again, black layer here. When you're going to engrave, the number one important thing is for that layer, we normally cut in cut mode uh, when we're doing cutting. This wants to be in engrave mode. And when we flip it over to engrave, we can double click on it. Again, we're setting speed and power. Uh, recommendations starting from the material book and setting scan gap here as well uh, as re also recommended in the material book. Basically we we'll always want to have bi-directional on uh, and that basically means the laser is going to be going back and forth rastering and it's going to be uh, engraving going both left and the right so it's a little bit faster. But that's it. So you have this layer set up for engrave with the proper settings in raster everything's closed polygon and then you download and hit go from there. So we talked about vector engraving so now we're going to talk about bitmap engraving so the one big thing that you have to know working with laser cut in order to engrave a bitmap it has to be a one bit black and white BMP file so again not color and not grayscale one bit means perfectly black perfectly white uh, no uh, levels of gray in there. And some programs can actually generate a one-bit uh, uh, black and white file, and some cannot. So right now I'm just using plain old MS Paint because it actually does very well. And I have this little wonky drawing up here, and I think it's wonderful. So this is exactly the image I want to engrave. So how do you convert this over to a one-bit black and white bitmap? Well, it's real simple with Paint, which is why I'm starting with this. You just go File, Save As, BMP, and in this you have a save as type here, and I can just change this to monochrome bitmap. And when I do, I have untitled BMP, it's going to save that again as a one bit black and white bitmap. And when I do, you will see color quality may be reduced. Of course, this is going to happen. And if I hit OK, it's even going to show in here that now everything here turns black and white, and now you can see all those subtle levels of color and stuff that I had in there just completely a lot of them went away some of them turned black uh, paint is kind of stupid it doesn't give you a lot of options on what to do but if you have something let's say it's a high contrast picture that the program will be able to make quick work of you can certainly do it that way you can go and fill it in yourself uh, it does obviously have a few little gradient options here and all these things as you can uh, you can see uh, 
they're giving you uh, either black or white. There's no gray in here. So now I have my one bit black and white bitmap saved. I can bring up laser cut and I can go file import in all file formats. One of the valid formats is BMP that it will import. So if I look in here, I don't know, I gotta look under date. Untitled BMP, that is my image. And when I open it, ta-da, that's what I get right in here. And I could move it around if I want, obviously, on here. I can scale it either this way. Remember, if you hold down the control key, when you rescale from a control corner, it will constrain that uh, so the aspect ratio doesn't change. If you don't, then you can mess up your aspect ratio like that, which you typically don't want to do. But anyways, having that in there, and again, if I have this here, I want that layer to engrave, and I'm going to set speed and power and everything uh, and scan gap up here accordingly. All right, so I showed you what Microsoft Paint's capabilities were in terms of converting stuff from color to black and white, and they were a little bit limited. So I'm going to try something a little bit more advanced now, and I'm using a program called GIMP, G-I-M-P, and I'm using it because it is free, it's open source, it's on the machines in the lab, and you can download it and use it at home, basically on any platform. And uh, it, it's sort of like an open source version of Photoshop. You certainly could do everything here that I'm doing with Photoshop or something like it, uh, maybe even better. But uh, So if you work in a program like that, uh, the same concepts will apply. But for this uh, demo right here, I'm going to... Hang on, I'm going to open a file. So I have chosen a, uh, a picture of a face here, and I'm going to open that. And I've chosen this one just because uh, it's fairly high resolution, and it has this white background, so I don't have to worry about masking a background or anything. I just want to get the face. So suppose I wanted to engrave this face. So like we said, goal of this program is we have to convert it into a one-bit black and white bitmap. Uh, Paint gave us one way of doing this. The, the quick way that you do it through GIMP is to go into Image and Mode. And right now we're in RGB because this is a, a color image. And I could change it to Indexed. And you'll notice right off the bat that Indexed has a Use 1-Bit Black and White Palette. And I could just hit Convert right there. And ta-da, this thing is converted to 1-Bit Black and White. Uh, doesn't look too great. Uh, so I'm going to hit undo, control Z, we'll get back to that. And we'll notice that in the same thing, mode indexed, uh, there is a few options for converting to one bit black and white. And the primary one here is dithering. And I chose no dithering, which is why it just gave me straight black and white. But I could choose one of these dithering options. And there's three of them here. I'll choose this one. They all look a little bit different. If I convert, you now see that if you were to zoom way in, you could see that it's, uh, you know, it's pixelating. Uh, with black and white this image and that could be a good effect to engrave with uh, the rabbit isn't as quick as picking up with little tiny details like that but that could still work let's try another one again image mode indexed instead of uh, normal i'm going to go to reduced color bleeding and this gives us a uh, a little bit of a different effect a lot of the stuff on the forehead and the bulk of the skin now just went right to white some of the mid-tones actually converted to a dither, and the darker stuff just stayed black. So it's a combination of white areas, black areas, and a little bit of uh, mid-tone dithering. Again, I could try the last mode, image mode indexed and positioned. And this gives us something, I don't know, uh, looks a little bit square and blocky, but similar to the first mode. So those are the uh, the quick off-the-cuff ways that you can have GIMP do dithering for you. So let's talk about dithering for a quick second. So if you had a drawing like this and you had these gray levels in there, you might really want to dither it to capture those gray levels properly. But the rabbit is not particularly great at this. And the reason why is if you think about it, say you have a big area like the hair over here. The laser is going to scan from left and right. It's going to be off. It's going to hit the hairline. It's going to turn on. And it's going to stay on for the remainder of the entire line where the hair is, and it's going to turn off when it hits the end. But if we are dithering and we have tiny little pixels all over the place, the laser is going to have to quickly turn on and off 
at the beginning and end of every one of those little tiny pixels that it hits. And it, it takes a little bit of time to go from on to off. And the faster the laser is going, the harder it's going to be able to do that. So typically when we're engraving, and we're engraving with high speeds like 300 and 350 millimeters per second, it's really hard to capture every one of those little pixels that you've dithered. So basically means one of two things. Either those pixels aren't going to come out very well, they're not going to be very clear, or you're going to have to slow the laser down a lot and use settings much slower than maybe what's recommended in the cut settings uh, if you really want to capture the detail of those pixels. So, uh, you know, best practice would probably be to try to avoid as much dithering as possible. It's going to be a little bit better using pure black and pure white areas, uh, but if you really do want to have more dithering, uh, my recommendation is to experiment with it a little bit and see what speeds are going to give you uh, the quickest time and the best clarity for those dithered sections. Now say for instance I want a little bit of control as to how this was going to look. Uh, the quickest flow for me is uh, first I like to go for image mode and turn this not into index but into grayscale. So now it is uh, levels of gray here, which again, the rabbit cannot do, but um, we have that here. And now once they're in gray levels, we could go into colors and control brightness and contrast ourselves. And when we do this, typically the way I'll do it here is I will crank the, uh, the brightness way up. Sorry. I'm not the opposite. I'm going to crank the contrast way up. And when I crank the contrast way up, I can control the brightness. And the brightness, I could give me something, you know, like this. So I'm looking again at very dark areas and very light areas because those are going to convert to black and white to kind of eliminate those mid-tones. I can still have some mid-tones, but you see what it does. So I could do something like this. I could do something like this. I could do something like this, depending on how I wanted it to look. If I thought right here was a good balance between you know making the dark stuff dark and the light stuff light and having a few midtones i could hit okay with that and again this is still technically grayscale so i'm going to have to go into mode indexed but now if i wanted to do something like what was that reduced color bleeding that kind of gave me the black and the white and the midtones and i convert this again to black and white one bit now again, that looks pretty much exactly like how I adjusted the contrast, except those mid-tones now have this black and white dithering. So that's just a quick little example of how GIMP can help you take your color image maybe and fix it up to make it look like you really want to uh, have it look when you engrave it. So at the end of this process, now we need to export it so we can pull onto laser cut. So to do this, we go File, and we go to export as, and if I shrink the dialog so you can see it, uh, the default here is select file type by extension, which means that if you just put a .bmp extension on the end of this name and you hit export, it will export it as such. But there's one little idiosyncrasy that we have to be worried about here and this is that GIMP doesn't actually work natively in one bit uh, black and white. As you can see up at the top here, it says index color 8-bit sRGB. That means this is a color image, which means the BMP we just saved is actually not quite one bit black and white bitmap. So what's the best way to correct it? Well, you're looking at it, paint. So we're gonna go into paint. We're gonna file open that uh, why does that show up the wrong thing? That face bitmap file. And now we're going to pull that into here. And again, we're just going to go save as BMP. And we are going to do it as a monochrome bitmap. Save. Yes. Now, having done that, we can go back into laser cut. And we can import and find face BMP. And when we do, ta-da, our face shows up exactly like it did in GIMP. So let's say we're raster engraving a bitmap. And to make things simple, we'll say this bitmap is just a picture of a triangle. 
And since it is a bitmap, if we look at this triangle in the really bitmap, it's going to be composed of pixels, and the pixels are going to be blocky. And the ones here are a little bit blockier than they would be in reality. They're a bit bigger, but you can see them better this way. So that is our triangle. But what we're going to be doing with it, we're going to be raster engraving it. So we have these lines, and the lines have thickness to them. And as we've discussed before many times, the thickness of the lines determine a scan gap. So obviously, we're going to have to apply a scan gap. But wait, we already have a bitmap. And the bitmap has this DPI concept to it. So what we really need to happen here in order for this bitmap to be engraved with maximum clarity is we are going to want the scan gap that we're engraving to match the DPI of the bitmap. So we've established a correlation between DPI and scan gap. And there's only one formula that's pretty simple. They have to remember to go from the other. And it's basically that 25.4 over 1 equals the other one. So 25.4 over the DPI equals a scan gap. And the corollary, of course, is that 25.4 over the scan gap is the DPI. So where does the 25.4 come from? Well, you can remember that as the number of millimeters in an inch because DPI is obviously in inches and scan gap is in millimeters. So just as a quick example, a common scan gap you might see in a data sheet is uh, 0.085. And so what would the DPI be for that? Well, 25.4 over 0.085 is 300 DPI. So Laura, who's kind of the engraving expert, says that this is basically the baseline numbers that she uses in most of her stuff. But if for some reason you wanted to do something with a different scan gap, just plug in a different number into the formula and that'll tell you the DPI that you should be optimally setting your image to. Okay, so this last workflow we're going to get really picky with. Let's say we want this thing to be absolutely perfect and we want it to be two inches high. We've looked at the spec sheet on our material and for the material which are cutting, the sheet says we want a 0.08 scan gap. So we want to adjust this bitmap so it has a resolution that is commensurate with a 0.08 scan gap. So what does that mean exactly? For one, it means as we discussed before with our formula, if we go 25.4 divided by 0.08, that scan gap equals a 317.5 DPI. So 317, we'll call it 318 DPI. And we want this thing to be two inches high. Now I've pulled in a very high resolution image, so we shouldn't have any distortion in doing it. But if I go under image, scale image, it will allow us to specify a new height, width, and X and Y resolutions for this image. So I can say, my unit here is going to be inches. We want two inches high. And notice because this aspect ratio here is locked, it's going to automatically convert that two inches to the correct, or the two inch width. And, sorry, I said two inches high, didn't I? Okay, two inches high to the correct 3.55 width. And I can set my Y resolution to 318. Notice when I did that, it changed the width because it was kind of balanced though. So I can rechange my height to two. And so that stays. So all the numbers are correct. My X and Y resolution are 318 DPI. My height is 2 inches, and my width is automatically set accordingly. And now when I hit scale, the image doesn't look any different. However, oh, there we go. However, the uh, it's basically the same image. It is just uh, resized and re-resolutioned that. So now I can go through the same thing where I export computer's a little slow. Yes, I want to replace that. And then I can pull that into uh, paint, re-export that as one bit, and we'll pull it into laser cut. So I just opened and resaved this as paint as one bit black and white. So again, if I do import, this is our thing. Okay, good. Now, what would you have to do? Anything we pull in and import here, we have to go to the size tool and check the size. And it is 90 on the X and 50.7987 on the Y. So considering we want to two inches high, two inches is exactly that. So if 
this pulled in with the wrong size, we would have to size it here and again convert those inches to millimeters. But if we look at, we can do it right now for fun. We can go image, scale, image, and if we convert this into millimeters, 50.8 in 90.18. 50.8 in 90.18. So it came in correctly, and we could just cut that. And again, if we set this to the 0 0.08 scan gap, the resolution of this file matches that scan gap perfectly, and it would cut it properly. So I just want to again point out that scaling the picture to get the proper height and width with the proper DPI for the scan gap that you're going to be engraving with isn't absolutely critical, but for the best possible crystal clear picture uh, going through the process will give you uh, a little bit of a more optimal look. So one last thing. When we're raster engraving, as we know, the head is moving back and forth really fast, left to right, and it's turning on and off. And it's not quite perfect, so it, it heats up a little bit before it actually fires, and it, it stays hot a little bit after it fires. And as a result, you can get some kind of burning around the fringes of the stuff you're engraving, particularly to the left and the right of it. And usually that's not a very desirable thing. So uh, don't forget that you can either take... A uh, piece of tape, we have these big rolls of 12 inch and 6 inch sign transfer tape, usually sitting on the laser in the room. You can put that over your piece, engrave over that, and the laser will burn right through it to engrave the piece. And then afterwards, you can peel it off, and the burn artifacts will go away because they'll only be on the tape. They won't be on the underlying material. The alternative is that a lot of materials, particularly acrylic, will come pre-taped. So just leave that tape on there, engrave, and then peel it off when you're done. So another important note on what happens when you're in grave mode. Okay, so let's say we have a design here, and it's a star maybe, and we want to engrave this. We load this into the laser, and let's say our wood is a little bit warped. So we need to put some blocks on the wood to make sure that it holds down and it doesn't bend and is level. So being the good doobie that we are, we hit the test button first and we get an idea of the bounding box for the star so that when we place our blocks in, we can make sure that we can run that bounding box without the laser or the Z-axis button uh, hitting the, uh, the blocks as we do this. So normally we would uh, do that and we'd say, okay, this looks good, it didn't collide, and hit the go button and everything would be great. But it's a little bit different in engrave mode. And the reason is, is because as we know, when we run an engrave, the head zigzags very quickly back and forth like this uh, to raster each line. However, since it's doing so very quickly, it takes a little bit of time to speed up uh, and then to slow down You know, when it gets to the far left and to the far right to change directions. So what the laser actually does when we're in engrave mode is it actually starts a little bit further to the left and then it accelerates and it does the scan line and then it goes a little bit further off to the right uh, so it can slow down. And so then when it zigzags back and forth, it's actually over scanning the bounding box. So if we don't, t by maybe uh, you know two, three inches. So if we don't take this into account when we run our bounding box test, uh, the head could actually crash into the weights as we're running the real job. So what's the solution for this? Well, just be cognizant of it and move those weights, you know, maybe two, three inches off to each side so that when the laser actually runs the job, it's not going to hit those. So that's about it. Have fun with it. Remember to post some good projects that you do on Slack so we can all see what you've done with it. The only other recommendation I would have is if you really want to do a little bit more with engraving and you maybe want to automate the workflow a little bit and you want to have a little bit of a crisper result and maybe a little bit better performance in dithering, I encourage you to go, after you've done this a little bit and experimented with the rabbit, go take the full spectrum laser training and try this on the full spectrum. The full spectrum is set up a little bit better for engraving and the software is a little bit better for engraving. So I encourage you to do that. In the meantime, I hope you've enjoyed this. Have fun.